Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's one minute past uh, 11, so we will get going. Welcome to this event, which is the second in a three part uh, event series we are running, in, which is kindly supported by Legal and General, looking at the future of cities. Big topic, much discussed, lots of speculation, uh, but maybe a little bit less analysis and careful consideration, if I can say that. Um, and as I said, for those that came last week to the first event, um, I think we can be fairly confident that COVID hasn't killed our cities. Um, but I can also be reasonably confidently say that COVID will change cities in a variety of ways. And I think whilst we can see some of those emerging issues uh, come into, into being, the exact nature of them is yet unclear. And I think it will probably affect different places in different ways. So I think that's important for us to reflect on as well, which I'm sure uh, we will. Um, to make the big topic of Future of Cities uh, manageable, uh, in each of the events, uh, we're focusing on a, an aspect of the debate, although we recognize that they're all uh, interrelated. Uh, last week, for those that came, uh, we talked about the future of work and what that meant for our cities. Today, we're exploring the future of urban living, where will we live and how will we live? Uh, and next week we'll be focusing on the future of urban entertainment. So work, live and uh, play, but as I said, recognizing that they're all interrelated. Um, so before I introduce the panel, as always a few words of uh, housekeeping, the event is being recorded and will be made available on our, uh, on our website after the event. During your event, your microphones will be kept on mute. If you want to tweet about the event, the hashtag is Future of Cities. There will be opportunities to put questions to the panel once they've made their opening remarks. And you do that by submitting your questions, and you can do that at any time to uh, via the chat function to ask a question. So that's how you do it. And you can put them in at any time. Don't have to wait until we've heard from all uh, three of our panelists, and we'll be done by um, 12 o'clock. So let me introduce our panel. The first up, our first panelist is uh, Tim Bannister. Tim is Director of Property uh, Data Services at Rightmove. Our second panelist is Dan Batterton, who's the Senior Fund Manager for the Build to Rent Fund at LGIM Real Estates. And my third panelist is Sam Veal, who is the check, uh, Chief Executive of Blueprint. So that's our panel. Um, each will give their view on uh, the future of urban living for five to ten minutes and then we'll get into questions and i know tim is going to go first and he's got a few slides to show us as well so tim over to you great thank you andrew and hello everyone so uh yeah my name's tim i run the data services business at right move um and yeah, I'm going to show you a few slides today, looking at trying to answer that, that question or, or at least provide some context for it. Um, for those that don't know Rightmove, we're a property uh, website, um, one of the top 10 busiest websites in the country. Uh, we have two to 300,000 properties added to our site every month, uh, where estate agents, letting agents, new home developers are advertising their properties for sale or rent. Um, and then we have about 1.6, 1.7 billion page views of people, consumers, home movers coming to look at those properties. Um, and as I say, one of the top 10 business websites in the, in the country is about 1.67 billion minute, um, page views, as I say, 1.2 billion minutes spent on the site. And it's really that bit of the equation that I'm gonna talk about today, um, about demand and what people are actually looking for uh, and where are they looking for those uh, for their next home? So that's where I'm going to try and focus. Uh, so I'm going to share some slides now. So I think, yeah, there we go. Please bear with me and get it up and running. Share, okay. So hopefully, if you give me a nod, somebody that you can see. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Good. Right. So I'm trying to get. Uh, under the hood of this question a little bit around if people can work anywhere will they want to keep living in cities i'm a bit biased i'm a city dweller myself um, but uh, we'll see what the data says because that's obviously key so i thought it's worth mentioning well 
So bringing into the context here, you know, just what's happened over the last 20 months or so, um, which you know, 20 months we've had to live through, incredibly challenging. Um, it's, we've made our homes work harder than ever before. So they've become you know, homeschooling centers, they've become exercise zones, uh, they've become a place for pets. You know, so many people have bought pets, uh, squeezed them into their homes. Um, and for many people, they've also become a place of work. You know, I, I'm currently uh, doing this from home. So, and I'm sure many people uh, on the call are at their homes as well. So yeah, we've had to make our, our homes work. We, we, we were uh, crammed into them for, for many months. Um, and what that meant was as soon as we could get out and move, people wanted to move. So this is uh, looking back over the last 20 months, this is as, as up to date as we can get in terms of demand data. So what we're looking at here is the number of inquiries uh, sent by home movers in the sales market and the rental market uh, trying to find their next home. So if you've ever been on right move and you looked at the property listings and you requested details about a property or contacted an agent asking to view a property, that's what we're looking at here. So the real strong indications of demand. And we found over the last many years that that's a really good lead indicator of what's gonna happen. So what we saw with this, with the sales market, was as soon as that, you know, as soon as uh, the Prime Minister said, you've got to stay at home and uh, made a home moving, uh, froze the property market, demand did very quickly react. Um, it dropped off significantly as people were trying to figure out what to do. Um, but as soon as we were able to go out again and move home, and in fact, before that, demand started to pick up really, really, really quickly. Um, and that was that desire to make a change in one's life. So a group of people very early on made that decision to move. Um, and obviously, we've had various uh, tax incentives subsequently, um, stamp duty holiday and so on, which have um, sort of encouraged people to move as well. But there's underlying, there was just a very strong desire to move. And that has continued to this day. So demand is still really, really strong. Um, this is, again, two on year on year change what we're seeing here. And interestingly, I think it's the same in the rental market. Uh, the rental market didn't fall off quite as, as much as the sales market initially. I think it was slightly easy to move, perhaps, in, this, in the rental market. Um, and, but, but people's desire to make a change is reflected in the rental market as well as the sales market. You know, activity is just really, really strong, and it continues to be really, really strong at the moment. Um, so what is it that people are wanting to move to? Uh, to? Then I'll move on to where they actually want to find that. Uh, so firstly, I think we probably is well documented about this race for space. You know, you're expecting more from your homes. So what that meant was people wanted more space within the home, more space around their home, more of a garden, a roof terrace, a, a balcony, whatever they could get in terms of outdoor space, um, and then space around the home outside of those boundaries, so green space. We obviously heard a lot about people wanting to move to the, to the seaside or to the, to the countryside. That certainly was a theme. Um, but what it was that they wanted was certainly something around more space. And we did see that uh, on site um, initially. So this is looking at demand split by property type. And as you can see, as we came out of lockdown, it was really houses that people wanted. So people were moving, looking for that extra space in a house. So this is sort of three, four, five bedroom houses. You probably can't, it's probably difficult to discern those colors. Uh, quite a lot of colors going on there. But I'll point it out. So it's houses, all those top three lines initially, and flats um, were, were, were not the ones that were really shooting ahead. But I think it's worth noting that all de demand was up in all these categories. It, um, it just was up more in houses. And because there are a few of those houses around, that was where we saw a lot of the price increases, like very significant price increases initially. More recently, though, it's it has flipped round. So this part, you know, this up to date data shows that um, yeah, flats really for much of this year have been coming back, um, and that's where we've seen a lot of growth in demand more recently. So. Uh, I suppose the bottom line is people did want to make a change. What the what was definitely more space, uh, but 
it has been changing and those dynamics are changing a little bit. Um, and I think the same can absolutely be said in the where question. So this is uh, looking at where people inquire to. Um, so when, you know, when you're clicking that request details button on the listings on right move, um, we know obviously the, the postcode of the property where people are inquiring to and people tell us their postcode of where they currently reside. So we get an idea of from to, so the flow of demand. So it's kind of a unique insight we're very lucky to have um, at right move of, of that flow of people. Um, and obviously it's all um, anonymized and aggregated um, for the purposes of what we, what we do. And what was that telling us? So we were looking at the portion of city dwellers. So if you're in a city, are you sending an inquiry to within the city or are you sending an inquiry out of the city? And we found that absolutely that portion of inquiries out of the city increased. So this is comparing October 2019 with October 21 to really up-to-date data. And you can see that previously it was about 40% of inquiries from within a city were leaving a city, and that's gone up to 50%. What I think is really interesting though, and I think Andrew touched on this earlier, is that it's different depending on where you are in the country. It really is different across the country. So that's what it looks like for all these different cities that we've, um, some of the large cities in the UK. Yeah, it ranges from Manchester, where it's 60, over 60%, down to Liverpool, which is under 40%. But all of them increase, did find an increase, people looking to move out. So that's the sales market. Uh, it is the same in the rental market, but not to the same degree. So it's rental market under 30%, moving to just under 40. And again, uh, similar across, there's a, diff, there's a spread across different cities. But I think it's worth noting, you, you can see number one in both cases was Manchester, but it's not the same for all the other cities. So London was number three in terms of that list, in terms of wanting to move out from a sales perspective, but not from a rental perspective. So Londoners, rental Londoners are staying within the city more than they are from a sales perspective. Um, but I think in all cases, as I say, we've seen an increase. But what I think is really critical to, 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 to sort of remember with this is actually demand within the city, so demand into cities has increased. So this is not the, the death of cities, I don't think. So demand into cities has increased by 34% on the sales front and 46% from a rental side of things. So it's just the portion has changed, people looking to move. But overall, you know, people, overall people are wanting to move and cities are still a place where people want to live. Um, so, but what about the spread? Where are people actually looking to go? How far are they looking to go? Uh, so we're gonna show you here some heat maps around where those leads are taking London and then we're gonna look at a different city. So London, where are those leads looking to go? Um, so people, Londoners within the city, when they're inquiring out, where were they going? And has that changed? So you can see here, that's the heat. So it was back in January, quite close around London, a few, you know, Bristol, Brighton, some of these uh, cities where people might wanna make a change, longer move down to Canterbury, for example. You can see here, when we moved to May, 2020, there was a really strong knee jerk reaction, I think with those people, the early adopters coming out of the, of the gate, saying, I wanna change everything, I'm, gonna, I'm moving out. Uh, so there was a real heat to lots of those coastal regions. And I don't know if you can see the purple uh, within sort of the infilling areas, lots of people were looking to move to sort of the rural areas and some of those major cities, a lot of heat. So I'll just go back and forth again. So that was, you can see there's a big, you know, that, that difference between the two. Question is, what about now? So this was May 2020. So I think if I now move to October 2021, it's come back. So that heat has come out a little bit and people have come back towards, uh, towards clo closer to London. So I'll just show you that one more time. January 2020, May 2020, October 2021. So again, you can see that heat coming out a little bit, coming back into London. 
I think that is reflected in in, in uh, uh, lots of other metrics we look at. But these, this is a very very early indicator of what's going to happen. Um, and that's if you chart that, just stick stick all that data on just on the chart. That's what it looks like. So you see that in the immediate reaction of people looking to move out, or proportion changing, um, going along for a while, and then uh, and then it's sort of starting to come back a little bit. Just at the end here, if you see in uh, sort of the September, October, November time. Uh, but I think it's worth to this point around different parts of the country being different, just taking out Manchester for a moment. That's Manchester, uh, the heat around January 2020. So people living in Manchester, where are they inquiring? They're inquiring out. If you go to May 2020, so there was again that expansion. Uh, so those coastal regions doing well. Uh, some of the regions to the south gaining more heat again you can see there was definitely an expansion out but potentially not as extreme as we saw in london uh, and then where are we now with manchester well if anything i'd say manchester's got hotter so it's that that dynamic is still going on so in london where we saw expanding out and then coming back i don't think that's what we're seeing in manchester just yet so i'll just show you that again out and then back in sorry not back in out and, and still out um and again that's what it looks like when you chart it so very different shape to the london graph in terms of, of the uh, uh proportion of leads uh, leaving manchester uh, and i could say the same thing for all those other cities that we just talked about so sales you know cardiff looks really different for sales it looks really different for sales versus rent Sheffield looks really different. If you look at Glasgow, looking at any one of these cities, it is quite a different dynamic. And, and also there's been quite a bit of a change in some of those cities in the last couple of months. Glasgow, for example, potentially reverting back to maybe in, but quite close to where it was pre-pandemic in terms of this particular dynamic. So I think I just wanted to show that in terms of that move and how it's very different. It is happening, but it's different across the country. And I suppose my last slide, would be to show that it's not just different across the country, across different property types, it's even different within cities themselves. So London, for example, we're looking at, this is like looking at demand around the tube stations from north to south. So that's the Northern Line, people use the Northern Line, um, going from High Barnet down to Morden in the south, the left being the north, then in the center is the center of London, then to the right is the south. Um, and this is year on year change for demand into properties in those areas. So that's what it looked like as we went into lockdown or coming out of lockdown. So there was this real growth in the outer boroughs. Um, so you see the smile kind of occurring um, and those central areas not so popular, uh, but that heat has, that smile has sort of flattened a little bit when we look um, this year versus 2019. So real, a really strong reaction to moving out to, to the outer boroughs. We know that certain of those outer boroughs became very popular. They're places with larger properties. Um, but that has come off a little bit. So I think it's different where you look in the country and it's different even within, within cities. So just to summarize, I think there really is this, this enduring desire to move home. And I think uh, we're gonna see it continue for a number of months and, and into the early part of next year for sure and potentially longer. Um, the what and the where are changing, or well, they have changed, and but they're still changing. So I don't think we've settled on a on a norm just yet. Um, and the market dynamics differ very differently um, across the country. So hopefully that's been useful, a useful place to start. Um, yeah. And I'll hand back to you, Andrew. Magic, that's fantastic, uh, Tim. I really appreciate uh, that. It gives us a, a great overview and uh, lots of sort of areas to um, to explore in terms of how that demand has, on the one hand, changed, on the other hand, st stayed fairly uh, constant. We've had some uh, questions already coming in to you, so we'll, we'll get to them once we've heard from Dan and Sam. So, Dan, over to you. I guess you know, give us the give us the long term developer, long term investor. Um, perspective. Dan. Sure, thanks and uh, good morning everybody. Um, that was really interesting and thought-provoking and I think I agree with 
the majority of it. It's data, though, so it's hard to argue with data, isn't it? Um, so we at LNG, we currently got about two and a half thousand apartments that we have built and we rent out and we're building another four thousand and beyond that we'll probably double that to 15 to 20 thousand apartments and all of these are city centers right in the heart of the city so we're pretty convictional on the long-term future of cities um some of the things i guess in response to what we've just been seeing we've just had our busiest ever Q3 in terms of lettings, comfortably the busiest we've ever had. And so we were we were letting 10 to 20 apartments per day throughout those, those three months. So we've been hugely busy. And our interpretation of that is, is a few things. One is we've got had two years worth of inward migration into cities in the space of about three months. So Cities inward migration, the growth is normally 20 to 35 year olds first movement away from the family home into independent living. It might be linked to universities, it might be post university, but it's moving for, for work, but it's also moving into cities for, for society, for nightlife, culture, uh, restaurants, bars, people moving into cities to interact with people. People aren't particularly moving into cities to interact with buildings. They're moving to cities because they like people. And that inward migration simply didn't happen in 2020 because there was, in some cases, no ability to move in. But the reason people love cities, that culture and nightlife was not open. So that movement didn't happen. The analysis we've done looks at outward migration from cities last year was not hugely out of step with the long-term average. That a similar number of people moved out of cities to the relative to the long-term. And those are normally over 35s who have lived in, in city centers for a period of time and then move out. And, but the, the difference was there just wasn't that inward migration. Now that's come back, that demand we are seeing is, is pretty significant. I think it's interesting thinking about where the demand is as well. So our biggest demand is for studio and one bed apartments. It isn't for bigger apartments and more space. We are finding people are deciding where they want to live and, and then they're working out what they can afford to pay to live in that location. And if they can afford to rent a two bed, they'll rent a two bed. If they can afford to rent a three bed, they'll rent a three bed. Um, and if it's a studio, that's what they'll take. So it is the location and it is the city centre nightlife that they principally want or the city centre culture that they principally want. I don't think that is entirely led by access to offices. I don't think, I think well, a, a number of us here are, are all sitting at home on on calls, we're not, it, people aren't living in city centres simply to access an office easily. That is one of the reasons people want to live in city centres, but not the primary drive when you're 20 to 35 and moving into cities. The primary drive is that access to society and culture and access to your friends. Um, one other point I'll just touch on and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop is, I think the, the environmental benefit of city centre living is often overlooked. City centres can often be seen as grubby, dirty places because of pollution from transport or, or historic industry in those locations. The, the environmental benefits of having a higher density living in a city centre so that infrastructure doesn't have to, to be as stretched across the country is significant. You don't need you know, pipes to, to get water and electricity infrastructure and all of that infrastructure is saved by having higher density city centre living. And I just think in a you know, post COP discussions, we should just think on that as well. Our residents really care about their carbon footprint. And in a way that I simply didn't expect over the last, over the summer, we have residents asking us what the rent is. They ask us how big the apartments are and they ask us what the carbon impact is of that apartment. 
And a year ago, we would never have had those questions. What is the carbon footprint of living in this building? That technically goes significantly beyond what's the EPC rating. And our residents are asking that, or some residents are asking that today. A huge number of them will be asking that in 12 months. They'll all be asking that in three years. And we need to look at how cities can actually promote themselves as being a, a green solution to, to, to living. And part of that is having higher density living in, in city centres. On that, I'll pass back to you, Andrew. Very good, Dan. Great, great comments. Um, and touching on, so if we heard a lot about the, the demand side from Tim, he's starting to, to talk a little bit about the supply side and how that kind of responds and how it needs to respond, which I think is an important point we'll come back to in the conversation, just to say your final point about the environmental benefits of urban living in general and uh, city centre living in, in, uh, in particular uh, is something that we've been looking at um, for quite some time. So if you're interested in all of that kind of stuff, you can see all the research and analysis and uh, ideas that we've got on our, our website. So if that's particularly of your interest, go and have a look at that. Uh, but let's turn and hear from Sam. You're going to be talking a little bit about what where Blueprint is, Sam, what you know, the kind of work that you've been doing. You've been urban living pioneers before it was, uh, you know, before it was sort of fashionable to be so. So give us a view on uh, on the work that you've been doing and where you think this is going to go. Thanks, Andrew. And, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Sam Veal and I, I work for Igley Regeneration. And uh, my key responsibility is to look after Blueprint, which is a public private joint venture between Nottingham City Council and PFP Capital operating in Nottingham. Uh, my other responsibility is I'm co-lead for Igloo Regeneration's development services business. And we work across the UK from uh, Glasgow in the north all the way down to the south and, and the southwest. Um, 20 years ago, Igloo developed something called Footprint, which is our sustainable investment methodology. And, and uh, the thing that binds us and all of our clients together is that all of our clients want to put social value and sustainability at the heart of what they do. So in fact, Dan's comment there is actually a very helpful segue into Blueprint and Igloo's work. Um, by using Footprint on all of our projects, we drive both social and commercial value through our projects. And in fact, our customers seek us out because of those sustainability credentials. And, and I suppose uh, Blueprint's been operating for over 15 years now. And in those early days, they were early pioneers that were, were very much engaged in the sustainability aspect of what we were doing. And perhaps it wasn't, it wasn't in the mainstream, but that's absolutely what's happening now. It's completely uh, mainstreaming. Um, I should say our focus is entirely urban living. Uh, we work to revitalise brownfield sites on the edge of and in city centres, both for, for work and, and living. And that's about um, opportunities to uh, reduce uh, reliance on the car, leave the car at home, and on supporting low carbon living and low carbon working. And, and um, I'm very privileged to say that one of the projects that Blueprint's involved in, which is uh, called Trent Basin, which is part of Nottingham's waterside regeneration zone, was actually cited at the recent COP conference because of the community energy project that's happening there. So um, that was both exciting and, and, and very humbling to be to be included in that discussion. Um, in terms of in terms of where it's going and demand, I think um, it, fascinating seeing the stuff that Tim shared with us this morning. At our experience, we, we're not anything like the scale of, of Dan's output with LNG, but um, all of our homes. So as the pandemic hit, we had customers just moving in, and there's some great stories there about community so so we develop urban dense generally housing some apartments but but more so low rise um, some of my colleagues in the northeast are doing some uh, some much larger apartments but typically in nottingham we're on at the low rise end and um whilst whilst our architecture is quite dense all of our homes either have a small garden and terraces, roof terraces and balconies or some form of external space. Um, we put a huge emphasis on flexibility. So our, our homes have been ready for live work for years and years and years. And actually also about individually being able to control rooms. So, you know, you can be uh, 
you could be working out uh, in one room and have the temperature and the sound and everything controlled to how you need it. And you can be on a call like this in another room. So um, that's that's something we've invested in in our design. And in, in terms of what's attracting people um, is most definitely the, the sustainability angle. So our demand is really high. All the homes that we have available at the moment are um, reserved off plan. So we don't we don't have any stock available currently and um and actually uh, it started off with those pioneers those very well, well informed individuals that that sought out blueprint homes because that's exactly what they were looking for uh, but where i'm where i'm very pleased we're also getting to is that people are finding us because of the quality of our architecture and then they're starting to understand the the energy and the the carbon credentials of what we do and they're absolutely bought into that. So I can only really reinforce um, what Dan is saying. We've had some people move to our, our homes um, from, from London, although interesting enough and, and in direct opposition to something that Dan was talking about earlier, a lot of our early adopters are actually retired downsizers moving from the suburbs back into the city. And, uh, you know, what Dan was saying about infrastructure very much chimes chimes with us at Blueprint, but also that human infrastructure. They say, that's where all the services are. You know, that's where the health is. That's where the culture is. That's where all the leisure opportunities are. Um, and we've we've seen no let up in the interest in, in living in the city. We, we spend a lot of time making sure there's good green and blue infrastructure, so biodiversity, that there's, you know, there's nature is apparent in our projects, which definitely helps. I think we've all discovered that's helped us through lockdown. Um, but actually, uh, our demographic is starting to shift now to emerging families, and we've always had young professionals as our customers. Um, but we are starting to increase our appeal to, to families. But historically, it's those, it's those retirees wanting to move back into the city that have been a very key uh, customer base for us. Fantastic. Very good indeed. And um it's super helpful. It just reminding us that um, our cities can be attracted to uh, older. I would say old rather older rather than old. Uh, you know, present companies uh, older as well as uh, younger uh, portions of um, society. When you kind of look at this, you so you, you see that. So uh, that's really helpful. Uh, Tim, I want pick, come back to you first off, Tim, just to pick up on whether you you know in the in all of your data are you picking up some of the points that dan was making there and sam about factors other than the sort of internal setup of the house in terms of how people are thinking about where to move you know in terms of environmental considerations or location factors not obviously at the city scale or the big place scale we can see that but i just wonder if, if you see more of that you know kind of the way that's affecting how people are thinking about the, the next move uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. I, I'd agree. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I think on the physical makeup, you know, I think I've touched on it a little bit, but like, you know, things like balconies and those kind of aspects have become increasingly important when we have, we track things called um, keyword, keyword sort. So people key in like, actively, they have to find it and then key, key a word in because they just want to see properties that have those. Um, and in, in the rental market, balcony, for example, has become, it always was important, but it's kind of increasingly important. Um, there's also, um, yeah, and it's sort of some of those communal elements. And we know, we know some of the build to rent um, offering uh, has proven, you know, those aspects that sort of are typical of a build to rent building are actually the types of things that people are increasingly looking for now. So they, they, you know, they're kind of set up for home working, aren't they, with those communal spaces where people can go and spend time working or in the house and so on. So I think we've definitely seen some of that come through. Um, and um, on the environmental side of things as well, um, we've definitely seen an increase in that. Um, it's still early days, I think, on, in terms of people's focus on it. Um, I think, but I think Dan did mention that. I think it's like we're, we're sort of making quite big steps. It's become. I, I think we looked at there's there's the stats I'll um, uh, use, which is like fifty. I think fifty eight. When we surveyed people, fifty eight percent of them said that an EPC had been an important part 
you know, if they found the EPC, it had played a role in um, them making the decision about their next home. Um, but when we said, what about your next one? This is like 80, 82% of them said it would make a difference in their next one. Yeah. So like their understanding and their importance they're putting on that is increasing very rapidly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, yeah so, I, so I definitely support what, what's been said. Yeah. Okay. That's really helpful. Um, Dan, I want to come back to you. We've had a couple of questions because it touched on a little bit of both what Sam and Tim were saying as well. So you, know, you, you talked about you know, going from what, two and a half thousand apartments up to, you know, 20,000 ish type apartments. And you very explicitly said, you know, city centers is where, you know, is your kind of focus. Can you say a little bit about which, in which cities are, are you focusing on? Is it big cities? Is it small city? I mean, how, how would you characterize where that most sort of 20,000 extra apartments are going to, you know, are going to emerge? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so we are looking at the bigger cities. Um, I guess partly to, for something Tim's just mentioned, which is those additional amenities that are offered in build to rent by having communal space. So yeah. communal work from home space. To be able to efficiently build schemes with that communal space, you need scale. You need 250, 300 plus apartments in a scheme. And that needs a depth of occupy demand and that needs a certain city size so we're generally looking at the largest uh, cities so if you were to look at the the largest 20 cities they're pretty much our our targets um and within those cities it's as central as we can get as central as we can get in those cities to be a lifestyle choice to people that are living in those cities and i think again just touching on um tim's point about the amenity space we have designed into all of our schemes space that we now call work from home space or business lounges. And I think 18 months ago, we would have called it a lounge or a community <laughs> space or somebody going wants the football. So we've, we've current, currently rebranding some of that space with some new signs. Um, the interesting challenge at the moment with that, I think, is it's such a long lead time to build something. And things that are on the architect's table desks today are going to have people moving in in five years time and it is a big leap of faith for any of us i think to go and create long-term changes in expected lifestyle based on the last 18 months yeah no, that's a great and so i've got a we've got a scheme in north london and we've got 500 apartments and 750 people living there i cannot tell you today how many of those are going to be working from home in a year's time yeah. I can tell you the work from home space is really busy today. Yeah. But I do not know if it's big enough or too small for two years time. Yeah. And it becomes a challenge as a long term owner of how can we design in flexibility and choice into schemes. And the same with apartments. Flexibility and design in apartments is pretty difficult because they all end up being you know, similar ish footprints. And how yeah. do you how do you create the ability to adjust those footprints? And so it's, again, it's about choice. It's not, it's providing balconies for some, it's providing second bathrooms for some, it's providing smaller second bedrooms, which are clearly an office space for some. It's the, the complexity seems to have grown over the last 18 months. And the decision-making is that bit harder now than it was because we don't yet have that long-term data to tell us how people are going to change the, the way they live, if they're going to change at all. Yeah, no, that's a great, that is a very good point. Sam, pick up that point, because I think it's an interesting question. I mean, you've been in this game, urban living for a, you know, for a long time. In a sense, how do you, how do you contextualize the last 18 months? You know, do you essentially kind of ride it out and you just think these are, you know, these have been blips along the way, but we, Essentially, what we were doing before, we kind of feel confident that we're, we're going to continue to do that afterwards. And what, where are the tweaks or the changes, do you think, as a result of the last 18 months? I mean, how, yeah, just give us an insight as to how yeah, you think about so it. I think, I think when, when the pandemic first hit and there was the big conversation once the markets opened up about this big exodus to the, to the country, you can appreciate that the board were quite vexed by that and um, wanted to, uh, you know, wanted to, to, to talk about that at, at some length. Yeah. And actually, it, it, 
for us, it wasn't playing out on the ground. Now, I should say that um, I'm sure lots of developers say this, but you can't buy a blueprint home or an igloo home from any, anybody else. You know, they yeah. are quite different. They look different. Yeah. Um, they're built to a different standard than the typical market home. So that certainly helps us. And as I said, you know, that there's always been a level of flexibility. So our homes are, our homes are designed so that individual rooms can be controlled as much as possible. There's um, enhanced sound insulation between properties because we build densely. Um, and we've always tried to build in flexibility because um, through working with our customers, we know that, that how we see a room might not be how somebody else sees a room. So as much as possible, there's some opportunities to, to flex that within your home. We've always had working space as a design in part of our home. And that was probably driven by our, um, by wanting to reduce the requirement on travel. So Igloo as a company, lots of my colleagues, lockdown was, was nothing new to them because they always work from home. Now I myself um, and my Midlands colleagues, we, we, we do use an office in Nottingham, but um, it, you know, we were used to working in that flexible way already. Um, so no need, no need changes for us. I think the key things have been, you know, the questions we asked ourselves were, are we giving people enough access to the outdoors? As I said, you know, our, our gardens are relatively compact when we have gardens. Yeah. That said, though, we've got some houses where the entire roof is a terrace or, you know, so we've got, you know, we've got quite a flexibility, uh, quite a range of different outdoor spaces. Um, and actually, I think what we've concluded, so what we've learned uh, through through the pandemic is one of the things that that we put a lot of effort into particularly when we're doing a large development like Trent Basin which is a large phase development is we're investing in creating a um, community organization so Blueprint Seed funded a community fund and we put together um, effectively the constitution and the infrastructure for a residence association yeah and um, and supported the early residents in, in creating that organization. And the idea about the community fund is actually, they can use it within their own community, but the idea is that they reach out and support the community that surrounds where they live so that they start to make those wider connections. Yeah. And, yeah. and that social capital absolutely paid dividends through, through the lockdown. Yeah. And in fact, somebody moved into one of our homes the day after everything was supposed to stop. And um, they, they and their and their partner had moved up from relocated from London, decision they'd made long before the pandemic uh, hit. And um, they, uh, it was lovely. There was a fantastic feature in the local news when they said how they were embraced by the community and how new neighbours and, and at that, you know, it's hard to remember at that time, we knew nothing, did we, about COVID? And it was really quite scary. And yet there was enough of an, a community embedded there that uh, these these visit these you know new arrivals were were yeah. welcomed in yeah. and yeah. were included as part of that community and I, so I think that um, no 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 immediate changes um, other than I think we just keep a check on uh, we our homes always have a lot of natural light and again I think that's been great for people's well being yeah. um, yeah. through the through the lockdown. But I think that the key thing for us is to get as much nature into what we're doing, albeit that we do it in quite, you know, we work in quite an urban way. Yeah. Um, and every opportunity, both both to support biodiversity, but actually for, for what it brings our customers. So I think long story short, no knee jerk reactions. Um, and uh, but, you know, we're not just assuming that's always going to be the case. So it's it's constantly on our radar. That's something that, that we in yeah. the board are, are watching very closely. Yeah. OK, that's a fair. Tim, kind of variation on, on that question to you, which is, you know, again, you, you were you, know, you showed us the data kind of, you know, how things immediately changed and how they be, you know, in various ways revert back to practice or practices we saw before. What do you think is the as we are today? What do you think the enduring legacy of the last 18 or, or you know, 20 months is, is going to be, do you think? Or what, what can you see in the data that suggests that? these things seem to have stuck or, or will stick, do you think? Um, or essentially we look back on COVID in, at least from you know, the world that we work in, you look back in, I don't know, three years time and actually you just see a kind of blip where, you know, like we do with you know, other things. I mean, well, what's your kind of take on that? Uh, so I suppose my first take on that would be, 
everybody's crystal crystal balls have been shattered all over the place over the last uh, 18 or 20 months. They, well, in what way have they been shattered? I don't uh, think they have. I think, I think a lot of people made grand statements at the beginning yeah, just I, based on what they thought was going to happen, but had no basis for it. And all of those kind of wild and wacky ideas are actually being shown to be wild and wacky ideas and actually we're returning to normal. But that's my own view. Yeah, well, I think in general, I was looking at some stuff this morning, actually, looking at some commentaries from last, uh, I think it's probably April, May, June time, and predictions around you know, massive changes in the property market, property market crashing, um, nobody wanting to move again, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. And, and obviously, that's not what played out. Um, and so I suppose some of the lasting legacies, uh, certainly from a would be to try and trust the data or look at the data more and try and get early indicators of what's happening. Um, we've certainly found that's been, you know, turning where possible, trying to merge uh, sort of your gut feeling about what might happen with, but trying to back it up with actual data because the data often was telling us stuff that was different to how you might have thought things were going to be going. Um, I think the data is also showing us, as we were saying, that we haven't yet found a normal. It, you know, the new normal is a, is a massive cliche from the last 20 months. And I think we've had a new normal probably every three months or so. Um, but I, so I don't think we've yet found the, the sort of the answer to what things are going to be like. Um, I, and I, you know, so I really sympathize with Dan's comment about how do you design, how do you design a building now for you know, based on what we're seeing today, but and trust that it's going to be actually what's going to be the case in five months' time, yeah. or even you know, or, or five years' time. Yeah, no, that's um, very good. That's so, good yeah. Dan, so, sorry, uh, Dan, I'll bring you in because we've had several questions from uh, from our audience, uh, thinking about or asking for kind of views on, you know, what should be the supply side response to the you know to this demand that we we've either seen or we're seeing or you know, we will will see. Um, I mean, what's your kind of take on on that? I mean, how does the supply side? How do you know the planning system? How does how does city? How should they respond or or react now to this sort of demand? As we either the change in demand or just the ongoing uh, demand for urban living. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Um, so I think there's a well, lots of things there. Um, the you know, I think it's important to remember there are cities in the UK that are not called London. And those cities are, are actually thriving and doing really well. And we've seen a significant, there's, there's a significant number of our new residents have moved from London and they're still living in cities. They've just got a different name to London. Yeah. So, so that, moves is an important kind of thing to think about. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, so just seeing people moving out of London is not necessarily any any downside to cities. Ultimately, we we need more front doors. We need more front doors, and across the UK, and to do that, we need to be able to deliver them in city centres, and we need to identify areas of high density accommodation in city centres, and we need areas of low density accommodation in city centres to give people the choice. If we don't do that, we're then going to start encroaching on the countryside and the green belt that I don't think, as a nation, we particularly want to do. But do you think this so, issue about, do you think this issue that people have, or some have, that, you know, because COVID has changed everything and people don't longer li live in cities, that has a detrimental effect on our ability to respond in the ways that you've just suggested? Do, do you see any of that playing out or not? No, I see it. We need to think about the space we have in the cities in a different way. Um, I mean, I keep talking about density, but increased density in specific locations in a city allows for very low zero density in other parts of the city right. to allow for public space and new parks and, and new biodiversity in city centres by having focused areas of higher density on brownfield land that is that needs to be regenerated that's been derelict for years. That city centre planning is very difficult when you've got planning teams in local authorities that are hugely under-resourced and we're asking that those teams to do more and more and those teams are the ones that are critical to providing increased supply of housing of all sorts across the UK 
And yet those planning teams have been squeezed and squeezed in terms of resourcing over the last 10 years, probably. And some, I think the, the fastest way to increase supply in this in, in the country at the moment would be to increase the resources of those planning teams. Okay. So that they can provide the correct advice to us as developers. They can establish clear and consistent plans in those cities about how they're going to, to grow. And then we can all respond to those plans and they have the resource to then provide us with feedback on schemes and it takes a number of months to go through planning and not a number of years to go through planning and there's some certainty all around so i think that if uh, if i was sitting in uh, with mr gove in his new department my my immediate would be invest in local authority planning teams very good i'm sure he's on the call under a pseudonym and, and listening to us uh, so you know i'm sure he'll take that on board um, sam your kind of reflection not not so much from well Take the, the experiences of Blueprint, but actually broaden that out. What what would you say in general around how we then, how cities kind of respond to this enduring and possibly even growing demand for urban living rather than the perceived decline in demand for? Yeah, urban. absolutely. I mean, I'd completely what, endorse what, what, what Dan has said. Tell us based on your in terms of the resource of, of planning teams, that, that is genuinely a real, we see that as an issue across all the territories that we're working in. Um, you know, that's, that's absolutely, it's absolutely critical. I think um, this is really an exciting time for cities and, you know, and, and through the pandemic, there's been lots of discussion about what's going on in the retail world. And we've seen, you know, some significant sort of historic names disappear. And, and you know, we, we know all of those stories. But there's an opportunity for cities to, you know, to some elements of the city to reinvent itself and, and really be, you know, Dan has already said, you know, he's not sure that people will go to cities to work necessarily. And some of that might happen and some of it might not. Yeah. But actually, there's still they still make so much sense, both from a carbon footprint point of view and also from having that sort of concentration of, of culture and life. And um, I think that. Um, in terms of getting that balance right, it's a challenge, you know, so I don't know, I don't know actually if Dan experiences this, but for us as, uh, as urban developers, um, you know, student accommodation is a challenge. So I, I, don't, know if, I don't want anybody to think that I'm anti-student because I'm absolutely not. They bring incredible wealth and, and vitality to, to all of our cities and particularly to a city like Nottingham, which has got two great universities. Um, but without levels of control, you know, normally student accommodation will give you the best bang for your buck all day, every day, just because of the density. So creating those different places and those different living opportunities and having a mix of more transient populations and those populations that want to stay and be vested in that city and work in that city in the longer term, I think is, is really important. Um, I think that still creating, I think that, that the housing element is a, is a key part of that, but then there has to be a reason for those people to be there. The city has to be a sticky place in, in a good way. You know, it has to offer those services and those opportunities to have, to enjoy different lifestyles. So uh, for me, that's, that's the next challenge. And that's something that Igli is quite excited about engaging with in terms of, you know, potentially there's gonna be some large buildings that are vacant, that there are really interesting things that you could do with. And then again, you know, Nottingham's right at the heart of that at the moment with the Broadmarsh Centre and, and the whole regeneration of their city centre and rethinking what that looks like. But that's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, and I think we're seeing that play out in a range of different scales across the UK. And, and, um, and you know, again, like Dan, you know, London isn't the only city and, and it's great to, to see that, um, you know, one hopes that although I think a few stumbles on the on the um, the leveling up, but you know, one hopes to see a lot more of that because um, the network of cities in the UK um, and you know, cool cities which are you know slightly smaller cities and, and the larger cities that Dan were talking about, um, they you know they bring a huge amount to to us as a nation and and to the individuals that that live and, and make them the great places that they are. Very good. No, completely uh, agree with. With that Tim just your thought on um, you know given that the data that you look at the analysis that you're you know you're undertaking what what would you what are you and what would you be saying to you know cities and on the supply side how should they how should they interpret and 
use your insights to respond on the supply side? What would you be saying to them? Yeah, I, I think, yes, you've got, to, you've got to dig into the data. And I think what people have identified here is it's, it's a lot around that demand is, is who. So it's not, the, it's not the same for everyone. Um, and, you know, which cohort are you going after? Um, you know, if you talk about the, the sort of uh, the younger cohort in their 20s, I think, if anything, the cities are more important now than they ever were, for example. You know, they, they really appreciate come to appreciate, understand what community means. And you get that in the city. We've surveyed them. They've said that they want more of that community feel and they've actually learned and found that. Yeah, because you've done quite a bit of demographic analysis on your, yeah, on, so, you know, on your data. Yeah, right? we, we found that that's what they want. That's what they found. They, you know, 30 yeah. plus percent in, in people in cities found that they like their city, their home more um, after lockdown than they did prior to it. From And the words they were using were community. So they were finding community in a city. It's not, sometimes people think of a community as being like villages and whatever. No, it's, it's, it, they were finding it in cities. Um, and we've also asked them, they, they don't have aspirations to move out to the, the seaside because, you know, as Dan and Sam have said, you know, the things that they want are in cities. So the cultural aspect, the, the, the um, social aspect, that's what cities have. What I know that they don't like at the moment is commuting. They don't want to get on a, if they, can, if they don't have to commute to their job, they would ideally like that. So they'd like to be living near their job and near those cultural aspects and near those social aspects. And so it's about providing that, I think, um, in those city centres to that, that cohort, um, which I think is going to be uh, definitely something that people are looking for over the coming years. Very good. And, and all three of you are very neatly uh, are promoting next week's uh, event, which will be the third, which is around the sort of the, the, the entertainment aspect or the play aspect or the, the cultural aspect, the creative aspect that our cities uh, can bring and should be offering in terms of uh, making sure that they're successful as we move through the, um, the, um, the COVID uh, process. Um, it's very close to 12 o'clock, so we need to um, finish. There was much more that, many more questions, much more we could have explored, but we've um, run out of time, um, sadly. So uh, first off, huge thanks to my excellent uh, panel, Timothy or Tim, Sam and Dan. They didn't have to be on the panel with only three letters in their names, but it's always easier when you do it as a chair, uh, as long as you can see their name and you don't get them mixed up. But thank you very much to my um, panel. Great insights and great complementarity between your insights as well. A huge and big thanks to, uh, to Legal in General for working with us on this series of events. It's been a, a hugely rewarding experience for for us at the centre. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your um, questions. As I said at the start, um, you can get a recording uh, of the event and indeed um, the slides that Tim uh, walked us through earlier on um, on our website, centreforcities.org. I said the third event in this series, the third and final event in this series uh, will be this time next week. So next Thursday, the 25th at 11 o'clock. And we'll be looking at some of those issues that all three of them um, today talked about, which is actually that broader appeal and offer outside of work and outside of the home that cities can and should uh, be offering to, uh, to residents and to visitors alike. So hopefully see you all then. But for now, thanks again to my panel. Thank you all for joining. Uh, take care and uh, stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you.